Hi guys, we, welcome to the latest edition of Craig Houston Talks To. We've got a great guest, uh, known for a few years, um, guaranteed to entertain you with this podcast. Um, thank you for coming in and let me introduce Hugh Burns. How are you? Very well, big man. Yeah, I thought we were uh, recording about half an hour ago. We were into some daft stories, but no, I'm delighted to be here. I've been watching your stuff online and uh, glad to be a part of it, aye. Great, well, I can't, I thank you for coming in because yeah. it'd be a lonely show sitting here myself and uh, <laughs> talking to yourself. Talking to myself. <laughs> um, so, we've, you know, for some great guests, obviously, majority yeah, yeah. of the Rangers connection. Sure, so, it's sure. great to, to have you in. Um, so, what I try and do is just go through your life chronological order. So, let's get back to um, your formative years, the memory of your dark old boy. I'm guessing you were born bred there. Yeah. Um, how did you know what was life like there? And, when you get involved in grassroots football, just could you talk us through that? Sure. Oh, listen, I think I started playing uh, with, with, with the boys' brigade when I was seven, Craig, and I lived in a little village called Ashkill, just outside Larko. And it was under 11, so I'd managed to get down and lie that I was 10 to get in the team. They wouldn't have let me in as young, and I, and I forget that. Um, so uh, that was my kind of just welcome to football, got on me, and, and playing with the older boys, it was great uh, to, be, to be part of that at seven year old. Uh, progressed through the boys' clubs uh, in Larko, played with a, a little team called Hairless Hill Boys Club, and you know we, we just seemed to win everything. We had a lot of good kids, a lot of good players. We had great people that looked after us, a lot of good people, and uh, it was just a kind of natural progression to uh, to go to, to a better boys' club. And, and uh, I've, uh, probably a lot of people don't know this. Okay, I was born and bred in Ashkill, Larko. And I probably won't get a wee bit of stick about it, but I don't really tell everybody. But the fact I'm in here, I'm here to tell you the truth. I was actually a Motherwell supporter, Craig, when I was a young boy. I was a Motherwell fan. And and for me, uh, I then went to Fur Park Boys Club when I was 13, 12 and a half, 13. And um, they signed me on an S form at uh, Motherwell. And um, so I went in training the two night, two days, you know, during the school holidays and what have you. Be a part of Alan McLeod was the manager. I was playing with Fur Park Boys Club, I was playing well in Murrow with my team, so it was really, it was working out great for me. I, I was playing at Loch Park one night in a, in a school's representative game, and I got in the back of the car, and my dad turned around and he says, um, he says, listen, we've just been approached by two Rangers scouts tonight. And I went, two Rangers scouts? He went, aye, he says, Rangers, what are you saying me? I says, can't sign for Rangers, I says, I'm saying my mother will. So at that time, clubs were only allowed a certain amount of players they could sign on professional or form contracts. So I was the unlucky one. Uh, I suppose it worked out long term better for me, I suppose. I, well, it did, of course, that when McLeod signed me, he put my form in his row. And I wasn't registered at Park Gardens. So when he, my, dad, my dad then told me that the Rangers had wanted to sign me and that was, I was totally gutted. I was, I was right my heart, really. The fact that they did that with me. And, uh, well, the next night, George Rinseman, a uh, famous scout, was uh, standing, chatting at the door, and he came, sat down, and it, it didn't need to sell Rangers to me. So if you're, if you're, if you're not officially saying, with Motherwell, and Rangers come chatting, um, I signed in the dotted line. So what age would you have been at this point? Sure. Just, just uh, approaching 14. Approaching 14. So their move then was to move me to Gartcosh United, where a lot of the S forms for all the clubs congregated, really. That's where they put all the good players. We Derek Ferguson, Big Slim, uh, went there. Rangers and David Proven at the time was in charge of us. Big David was in charge uh, of all the kids, really. Um, and they, you know what a group of kids he had. And he kind of darted them all around the city, but predominantly, Craig, most of them had had, had ended up at Gartcosh United. This is something I was just talking to a kid about last night uh, at training. We were up under 14 team, mm -hmm. and there was four kids signed pro youth for that one squad in the last season. Yes. Um, so we had to do a lot of recruitment. So there's a lot of kids that, good, good players, had replaced them, but I don't know their stories. I know where they're from or whatever. So I was standing talking to him and he took a wee knock through and training. So he was put to the side and went out to talk to him. And I said to him, um, who was, who was it you signed us from? He was talking about that and he was talking about his school football. And I mean, don't you go to the same school? Lanarkshire boy. Mm -hmm. And I thought, hold on a minute, mate. He, you, 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 that's four. And you know how much? Five. And I know he's Lanarkshire, he's Lark Core. 
That team's got seven players for Lanarkshire coming out of Lanarkshire and coming to your club, which is great because good players and every yeah, team yeah. wants players. But it made me think, see, back in your day and back in my day, see if we, I was Renfrew, Sheriff Paisley, Linwood, the uh, leagues I was playing in, see if we drew a Lanarkshire team in the Scottish Cup, you always went, because Lanarkshire had a right stronghold of uh, clubs. And I was saying to him, um, but Jervison, oh, they're rotten. Like, seriously, when I was a kid, your Jerveson's, your Mill United's, and there was a right strong community of good grassroots clubs in Lanarkshire, and I think there's still good clubs in Lanarkshire to this day. But I don't think it's anywhere near the level it was in the 70s, 80s, and the 90s. I don't know what's happened there. Maybe people can go into Glasgow, they can go elsewhere and play football easier than we could when you and yeah, I were but, kids. but a lot of these kids that are getting brought in, for me, at a far too early stage, eh, Craig, and, and, you know, by 10, 11, 12, they've been told they're not good enough. Where that's probably why there isn't strong boys clubs because the senior clubs are taking these kids in and training them two and three and four nights a week. Which personally, I don't agree with. You know, you, you let the kid, you know, fly the nest and decide what club he wants to go to. I don't think kids should be settled down with any particular club at a really young age. So that's that stopped the progression in the boys clubs. Ends nobody coming through. It, it then stops the, the schools football because it was really aimed then to be. A, a, an international, a, you know, at 15, which I was lucky enough to get as well. So it was, you know, it was um, Lanarkshire schools, Scottish school boys. How does it happen now, Craig? And then the next step is going full time. So it, it seems to be these kids that are in, they're, they're tossing the scrap heat early on and, and they're at the game. So I, I just think the structure of the game right now has got a real detrimental effect on kids coming through. Uh, it's funny you say that because God, God rest him, no long before Walter Smith had passed away. It was about six months before we were aware he was ill. And uh, he, he was, I was talking to him on the phone one day and we were talking about kids football. We were on the phone for about an hour. Rangers had just beat Celtic. And there was five minutes talking about Rangers and the other 55 minutes talking about kids football. It was fascinating for me as a guy. You know, the man's a, a, a demigod he's a, to me and um, he made my connection to grassroots football. It was a, it was a great hour mm -hmm. chat. Yeah, and one of the things uh, Walter Smith said to me is, he says, see if, I was managing the Rangers. He said, if I wanted to sign a boy, 22 year old, I'd normally offer him a three, a four, or a five year contract. But see, if I want to sign a kid at 12, it's a 10 month contract basically you're signing. That's all you're committing. And he said, and if, if clubs had to do the same with the young kids as they have with the, you know, the, the, the younger pros, yeah. and they had to commit to them for three and four and five years, you'd probably find they wouldn't be as quick to pull kids out of grassroots. I thought that's a fascinating insight. There, you see, your kid that would sign when they were what two youngest, they can sign them about 11. But can we've got kids at seven that play for us that are training with Rangers and Celtic, and they might train with them for three years before they're old enough to sign. But that kid could be training with Rangers, Celtic, Mother Hearts, Hibs, the whole it's crazy, right? The, the system. And I thought that's a crack natural insight. But so, who, your time, you're you know, you're, you're playing for for Gat Kosh again, a, a, a good club uh, at the time. And, uh, who who was there? Who who did you play um, with the time it meant made the grade? Well, it, it, it was it was quite funny. Uh, in in the particular Gatcoach team, I was quite fortunate that I then made the step up. There wasn't a lot of them, there was a lot of S forms. But the one that played with me was John McStay. John was a lot of boy, strangely enough, uh, that, that that played at Gatcoach. That but they were all S forms that didn't really really kick on uh, into professional careers, but they were all good boys. Um but I, I was I was so fortunate uh, uh, and to be a part of a, a youth setup at Ibrox at the time that was um, and I sing his praises to everybody and everywhere I go was David Proven, um, and I don't think David Proven ever get the recognition in a club uh, that, that he deserved. Um, and I get down to I don't know whether he just didn't fit into. The setup at the time as it happens with players, if your face doesn't fit or what, you never seem to be a part of it. But that big guy gave his his life to Rangers, uh, and and then wasn't he really well treated, Craig, uh, at the latter end. But I'll go back to players like brought myself through. These are all these are all boys that David Proven, George Rinsman, God rest them, Stan Anderson, all brought in to become S form signings uh, when John Gregg was a manager. That then became apprentices, then became predominantly on international footballers, played uh, a lot of games for Rangers and made Rangers a lot of money. So I'll start I'll start at the bottom of the ladder, I'll start with myself, of course. Uh, so so the, so I come through 
Uh, Robert Fleck comes through. Ian Durant comes through. Derek Fergus comes through. David McPherson comes through. Kenny Black comes through. Uh, and they're just the ones that kind of come off the top of my head. Now, they're all players um, that further down the line, when Soonis came in, Soonis she is every while, obviously. <laughs> Bar me, right? <laughs> but we'll go into that later on. But you know what I mean? The amount of players that, that David Proven had brought through yeah. uh, into the first team uh, were all brilliant footballers. Billy Davis mm. uh, was another one. Me, Billy, should for me, it'd have been. Well, he was a, a brilliant player at youth level. But Rangers were rich at that time. And and, and our big game at Gap Caution 80 was, surprise, surprise, sell it boys club, Barrafield. Wow. Because they knew I was an S-form saying about Rangers. And even at the age of 13, 14 and a bit, I was the biggest on still in the world. <laughs> um, uh, which was fine um, until my dad got into a wee bit of altercation one day. <laughs> Somebody, this is all, you know, at, at football level, at kids level. Uh, but Peter Grant played with Celtic, right? And, and even then, Peter was running about pointing at everybody <laughs> on the team. <laughs> Peter the pointer. So I was playing, I was actually playing centre-back. And uh, Peter was centre midfield. Because we, we always had tussles, but him and I played in the, the Lanarkshire schools together. And even to this day, Peter and I have got some good respect. And we, we're like one another, to be fair. We got on well. I get, I get Peter. He's a Celtic man that played with Celtic. I'm a Rangers man that played with, with Rangers. And that, in the 80s and the 90s, probably... That's the way the players were, Craig, you know. Um, but a great upbringing for the first part boys club to get Cush United to then get in the call up to go in, uh, and to do the boots and you do your first year apprenticeship at kind of just 16. I don't even think it was 16, I think. So who gives you that news? How does that actually work? How well, does it come about? What happens is uh, you get a phone call again for the club. Big Davey takes you in. Um, and at that time, Greggy was the manager. I had just got the job. Uh, John Gregg was a, was a actual manager of the football club and uh, Greggy takes you into the boot room and it's a very casual chat he went listen you're doing well with the boys club uh, you're thought highly here we want to bring in and you want to do your, your first year apprenticeship it's basically you've got a full year to, you're, you're on trial it's high and you, if you still play with Gart Kosh at 16 you could still play there I'll tell a lie no that was coming to an end Craig what happened then was they put me junior Right, they farm you out. because you're just not good enough to go into the reserve team. You're very young. Because the reserves let bring a lot of good players. So they then my first junior club was the Benz. They put me to the Benz at 16. And uh, it was quite a, a difficult one for me because at 16, at that time, the juniors uh set up was all kind of ex-pros, experienced. They could all play. And I remember going to the Benz mm -hmm. and actually not getting in the team. Believe it or not, I couldn't get in the team, but there was a guy playing at right back, and I forget his name, his name was Ali Marshall, and he was a Scottish international fullback at right back. He was a good player, and, and I couldn't actually get in the team at 16 because he was there. So David got word of that, and um, he says, listen, I'm going to move you. I want you playing. He says, I'm not wanting you to go and be on the bench at the juniors at 16. Uh, so he moved me to Canberra's Lang Rangers. Um, so that was a great move for me, Somerville Park. Great setup, good crowd. Quite intense, easy to get to training. I trained on a Thursday night, I trained at Ibrox every day and went down on a Thursday. Manager there, the guy called David Thompson, David McCulloch, who was an ex-pro, and I played with a lot of good older pros there. And it was great for me to be in amongst that. I'm with, you know, the, the, the Rangers during the day and then I'm in with the juniors yeah. at, at night, the right old school. So for, 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 a, for, a, for a learning curve, it was, it was really good for me. So you're 16-ish. Mm -hmm. Around 17. Yeah. Didn't it work out for you? But I mean, you speak to Frank the next time I'm on a bed. Oh, cheeky hens, aye. <laughs> Came on to bother for me again. again. Um, so you're, you know, you're into Camus Slang, 16 to 17 year old, playing it right back. You must have came up against some big sturdy geezers and going yeah. for, you know, playing against kids relatively your same age, apart from when you're a liar at seven and playing in the under yeah, 11. Was... But, you, you know, you're, so the physicality is a massive step up. So how did you cope with that? Sure. Well, I was always quite, I, you know what I mean? I was always kind of ahead of my years with, with my build. You know, I'd always like, big legs. It was strong and not overly strong that you know, I went win everything. But I, I was always, I'd, I'd always put my foot in. Nobody really intimidated me. But um, I, I, I just kind of, that was always a part of my game, Craig. I was never really worried about who I played against. As long as I put, you know, my show on the road, then 
then basically I could match who I was playing against. So for that point of view, yeah, again, the juniors uh, littered with old ex-pros. And what better that a 16-year-old that you're playing with that and getting a wee nick here and a wee nick there and learning and biting back, no biting back, playing with players that are helping you. And, and it was a great development for me at that age. And that just seemed to be the way it was. It wasn't the, you know, the, the 21s, what it is now, or the reserves. It was you went junior and you went junior and you take you to learn your trade and some get fun out and some kicked on. So how long were you at uh, the junior level? One year, in fact, somebody told me a fact. I don't know, you could probably check this or no. When I don't know if it's true or no. I'm only telling you what the guy told me and he was quite adamant. That the year I played with Cambridge Lang Dangers, the start of that season in the Central League, the same season but the different year going into the new year, I'm, I played for Rangers in the League Cup final at Hamden. So I'm starting the season at Cambridge Lang Rangers and I'm finishing the season at Glasgow Rangers. So I must have been doing some right, right back to be getting in uh, big joke slots. So who who was the season pros? Was it David McKinnon then? It's like because Davies was on the show just the last guest. So who was the right backs that you were having to try and oust at the At, at that the time, uh, Sandy, God bless him, had a long move yeah. to Hearts. Um, at that time, Big Joke had brought in Jimmy Nicol, first stint, yeah. to kind of take over. Um, no, take over, David. I think Joke sitting up. It was actually Greg Eight signed uh, David McKinnon, yeah, yeah. if I'm right. Yeah. So obviously Joke had brought in... So really, if I think, there was Jimmy Nick, D um, David McKinnon, and again, the right-back thing just kind of happened for me. I was, again, more of a central midfield player, a right side of midfield. So that it was really... I was putting right back with Camus Lang, but I, I don't know whether it was Big David Proven had seen me, seen, you know, be going back to play there long-term. But that that was quite unique, that season. And I did, probably at the time he didn't even realise it. But, you know, it was a hell of a call-up, wasn't it? You, made, you know, your old firm debut, you'll go and play against Celtic. And it was the first school cup final, 84. I don't need to tell you. Goes to Hattrick, bang, bang, bang. Big gate can push him in the box. And it was a one bonus saved at the rebound. Sorry, that so, was the last one. Yeah. Uh, so, what, what age were you in that cup final? 17. And this is your debut? Uh, no, I had played I had played at Motherwell in my debut for Big Jock and scored against uh, Motherwell. Quite ironic going back to Firth Park yeah. after leaving in a flood of tears. Um, I played in Ross County. I played in a guy, Billy Wilson, who then became Ross County manager. I played his testimonial, went up. That was my first taste. I got in the bus with the first team with the Robert Pritzies and the Dozies, God rest them, and all the Coiste and Cute. And went up to play a testimonial with Dingwall, Billy. Um, Craig, sorry. And uh, that was my first taste of it. But this is what happened that season. Uh, I played against... Uh, Glasgow Celtic. So your debut, your first competitive debut is against Motherwell. Against right? Motherwell. And are you still playing with Canvas Lang the week before and gone and training with them? Or how, how did, no, no, no. What happened then was I, I, they had brought me into playing the reserves then. Right. So, you know, you come away from Canvas Lang Rangers uh, and Joe Mason, who was Greggy's assistant, was in charge of the reserves along with Stan and Big Davey overseen things with the youths. But he was part of the reserves. So I'm in the reserves again with predominantly the boys I mentioned earlier on, who all played in the, in, in the reserves. Um, Kenny Lyle, uh, Billy Davis. Big Slum was just getting in the first team. But at least you Fergie and Durant were coming through as well. Flecky. Uh, Big Andy Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Big Andy played in front of me. Um, so there was a lot of good there was a lot of good kids. So this is all happening quite quick for you then because you went to Benz, yeah. you're only good enough to get in the Benz <laughs> you're playing a League Cup <laughs> final about a year later. To play with the Rangers. Aye. Um, so when you're in the reserves and it's that coming up to the, the, the first game against Motherwell, how does that get delivered to you? What's going through your head at that point? Well, uh, big joke was a lover of coming into the dressing room and no saying nothing to MD, but he came in and he pinned the first team squad up on the board. And I think that particular game... Somebody had to come along and tell me in, in the away dressing room because the reserves and the staffs were along in the reserves, well, the, the away dressing room. So I, I had no idea of being on this sheet. And I think it was one of the boys. And actually, if I did remember, it was Flecky. It was wee postal came in. And he went, he says, Hey, Masha, you better go and check that sheet. I think you're in that squad tomorrow. I says, kid, on. Because there'd always be the wind-ups, you know. You'd walk down a big custard pie and you weren't on it. You imagine walking back in. Slaughtered. So, uh, yeah, I went down. And I remember, 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 I remember
and he named all the squads. It started with Big Peter, Jimmy Nick, through them all, Craigie Parson, blah, 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 right down, be so, Bobby Russell, Coop, and Burns, and I'm going, oh, there's no other Burns in there. There's no other Burns here. It must be me. So, like we're saying Kenny oh, Burns. Oh, hi. I was like, well, I knew it was the Sam Burns, right? <laughs> right, so, <laughs> I went, man, no way, I said, I'm in the squad, I'm like, I walked back up the corridor, I'm like, can you believe that? Scam up and they tell the woman in the wash house because I would have a bit of fun with him. I said, I'm in a squad tomorrow. They're like, oh, Huey, bro. You know, back in the day, that was a big thing, Craig. Yeah. I'm in a squad tomorrow. Oh, can you get him quick enough? Up the stairs and asked Laura, can I use the phone? She went, aye. I phoned my dad. Dad, I'm in a squad tomorrow. Oh, my God. Wait, I phone your mom, didn't it? Show up. It just all oh, snowballs, didn't it? So, this is literally the day before. This is a Friday again. Friday, aye. Ah, Friday mm -hmm. squad in the Friday. And, uh, you know, be prepared for. Uh, Saturday. And did you, were you on the bench? Did you start so on the bench? bench? On the bench, on the bench, a big joke. And uh, I can't remember who was on the bench. In two subs, you know, you were, and, and big joke was in the dugout. Uh, uh, Totten was there with him because he brought Totten. I uh, can't remember our sub. Right, so again, get yourself warmed up. Uh, halfway through the second half, I'm out. And the fans didn't even know me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry. Very glad you didn't have ginger hair and it was Tommy Burns as well. <laughs> well, who's that? Curly Pearman on that. Man, warming up beside the park. I'm like, I'm not going to hear him embarrassed. I don't even know who's that. <laughs> like, they would have known, of course, uh, coming through the ranks and obviously uh, maybe hearing things about yeah, me. But yeah. you're up doing the touchline, warming up for Rangers and, you know, the folk are like, you see him going, who's, who's the boy? <laughs> <laughs> so you're on, what, maybe 20, 25 minutes? We daisy cut off the edge of the box. I hurt this thing and Hugh Sprott was a bit unsighted. And I remember it getting into this day. Didn't the boat right off? Oh, oh, died with him. <laughs> we're in the corner going daft. You know, at a position at the time. Can't he jumped right was, back. Can't even remember we were supposed to be playing, Craig, but I was on the bar and I was just happy to be there. Uh, and it was a decent strike. Hugh should have saved that. I met Hugh later in life. And, I, and I, he was like, I remember you scored against me. I went, I remember it was my first ever goal for Rangers. Not that I scored that many. But um, that was important, wasn't it? Getting on, making your debut and scoring. And you buy a lot of call that night. It doesn't get any better than that. No, it's all right. <laughs> and to top it off, it's a team that when you were 13, 14, that kind of really great to yes, you. Yes, 100%. Up, yeah, 100%. So, do you do we become a regular at that point? Or is it in and out? Or is, how, did, how did it pan out the rest of that season? I think the end of that season, uh, if I'm right, was the World Tour. He took us to America. Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, Did you have a passport? I thought you I should. had a passport. <laughs> had a passport, the worst passport for in the world. A big curly perm and a big sheepskin jacket. Right? Every time I went through passport control, guys wouldn't be like that. <laughs> What's happening there? I know if I get that picture. Anyway, we start off, we go to Australia, and he pulled me into the office of Big Ian, Big Wallace, and he went, listen, he says the under-18s, which I was playing under-18 use at that time for Scotland, uh, I did 15, 16, and 18s. Andy Roxburgh wanted to take you to the European Championships in the summer. He says, but I also want to take you in the World Tour to uh, the Rangers. And he says, have you made your mind up yet? Big <laughs> <laughs> Wallace. I says, Gaffer, um, no, that would get frowned upon in this day, saying I'll go a World Tour with Rangers, but I'll not go and represent my country. It was a hard decision, Craig, because... I was part of the 18s in Roxburgh, I was in a good squad in the 18s. But I could see th that Joke wanted me to go in the World Tour. He pays your wages. That was the bottom line. And I decided, I said, right, Gaffer. Uh, and I know I forget him saying this as well. I said, right, Gaffer, I'm going to the World Tour. And he went, right, that's fine. He says, but you're still going to date between noon and end of the season. He says, because you end up going to uh, Russia with Scotland. He says, so I want to keep, you keep doing what you're doing, or you'll not be going to the World Tour. <laughs> Bought me up, brought me down in the same sentence. So that's that's what he did. And you went to the tour. Went to the tour. Went to the tour. Um, broke into the team. Uh, broke into the team. Uh, I just naturally put me at right back. Um, I played. I played really every game. We, we played the Australian, Australia national team. We played in, in Sydney cricket ground. We played on the Melbourne cricket ground. It was beam live around the country. It was incredible. We travelled down Australia with the national team, seeing all the expats everywhere we went, we went to Adelaide, Newcastle, Brisbane, Surfers Paradise. I'm there with Bobby Russell. Bobby took me under his wing. David Cooper, my hero. You know, there were great players like John McDonald, 
Uh, sorry, John McClellan, John McDonald, Coiste, Bobby Williamson. Is that the trip that Bobby broke his leg? Aye, aye. That was the trip he broke his leg. Was there no two get legs broke at? Uh, or Big Colin McAdam. I think Big Week done it as well. I think Big Week. There was only one of them was on the part, was it no? Aye, there was one that was a wee bit. I still think the two still to come out about that one, but you need to ask McCoyster about that. Yeah, you're no, you're no first. And I can't tell you. <laughs> Uh, but aye, what, what a trip, what a trip on that, forget it. Um, arrived in Melbourne, uh, went to the Rangers Sporters Club, thought we'd buy a lark hall. Uh, you know, all these bears are outside of the world. Um, I remember the trip, it was a horrible trip, of course, you know, and Big Joe had his blazers on to uh, grey flannels, lined grey flannels, sitting on the flight for 24 hours. You're allowed to take your jacket off. Uh, but, but again, rules were different in the days, weren't they? Uh, and that was it. But travelling around Australia, we then down into Christchurch, into New Zealand. Uh, there was a big banquet that night, and all the players had all their names in the table, and they were all deaths of David Cooper, Hugh Burns, Bobby Russell. What an experience I'm like, 17, Craig. You're thinking every summer's going to oh, be last? I think every week's last. <laughs> From the Rangers, probably. So sitting there, fantastic times. Uh, we then, where were there? Where are we go to? We go to. Uh, America, we fly to, where do we go, to Minnesota, and we play Minnesota Kicks in the Astrodome in Minnesota. So we're uh, on the park, uh, warming up. On the, that time, it's obviously indoors AstroTurf, and uh, oh, there's 50, 60, 70,000 in this place, and the horns are going and what have you. So we go into the park, we're, you know, we're getting introduced, you know, American style, Cosmo style, we're getting introduced to the crowd and next so oh, it was quite embarrassing, but you had to date, right? And the next thing the Minnesota kicks turn up in these big yellow taxis. You know the big yellow <laughs> <laughs> hanging out the windies, waving at the fans, you know, and I'd be like, oh, where are we staying? I just couldn't believe it. Laughing on the side of the park. What are they laughing at the end of it? They absolutely pumped it. Aye. Well, they were all ex pros at like um I just try to think of them. I remember the boy um who'd be from Italy, Roberto Betica. She players like that were all coming to, to America because they were getting I was getting, they were getting big money, Craig. That's why they were doing it. Uh, I was playing against this wee winger. Oh, man, to screw me out of the park at the end of the game. <laughs> right, and that was Astro Turf. They had me twisted and turned, like jokes shouting at me. I was sweating, I couldn't breathe. I was like, oh my God, what a dude we got. But just being there was, again, learning curve. Uh, played one game there, and then uh, we finished off the World Tour, made our way to Canada. Took us to, uh, um, taking us to the Park Plaza. I remember staying in the Park Plaza. And we stayed, we played, uh, we played there and we played in Hamilton um, against uh, against their national teams. So how long were you away? Three days. <laughs> <laughs> Two and a half hours. <laughs> no, we were, we were away a month, a full month of, well, you think about it, right at the end of the season. And that was a lot of miles to cover my month, wasn't it? And then come back into pre-season. So we straight into pre-season. Well, I think we got maybe, I don't know, maybe a week, 10 days. To, to recover from the, the and you know it wasn't a mad boost session either again big job being job you know if there was a curfew uh he was waiting on it he would be in he would be in the hall uh, in the hotel for you waiting on you coming back so there was nobody messing about um so it was a, it was it was a it was a massive uh exercise for the club again to promote the club in that part of the world, which had been down well because bears were everywhere. So obviously they picked the countries well where we were going because all the expats were there. So see, you're, you're a young boy, you don't get the same sort of ties as some of the, the older pros that they're yes. playing with, who had kids and married and all that at the time. Yeah. So they basically finished the season, jumped on a plane, 24 hours, way down to Australia and New Zealand, get into Canada and America the way back, get home, get a week off, and then we're in for pre-season training. Yeah. I get these guys... Get holidays and breaks, but they all demented. No, I, I just think I don't. I, well, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I think there was there was there was kind of all quite settled in at the time. I was uh, obviously the young boy in the party, uh, so I, I would imagine they're wasting probably a, had their holiday when when they were away that that particular year anyway. Uh, but I there was a lot of happy faces when we came back to Glasgow. But there was, and who was your uh, who was your roommate for, for that? Um, my roommate, he changed that about, but it was it was predominantly Eric Ferguson, mm -hmm. uh, big uh, big in uh, Eric Fagan Garden. Uh, I was just fascinated the way he spoke. It was only twenty minutes to the road, uh, but I was like, "Hi, uh, how are you doing?" That? And when I met him at first, he had this big twang, 
But uh, I got to, I got to know Fergie quite a decent player as well. Big Joe quite liked him. Uh, was he centre forward? He was centre and ah, light right hair. Yeah, yeah. Aye. He was the same on on that trip. Believe it or not, it was quite strange because Stuart Monroe was on it, and um, Ian Ferguson, who I room with, and you know those two guys met the future wives on that trip. They met. Their Curfew wife. did they work then? Did <laughs> <laughs> no, they they were allowed in. <laughs> So how did that come? Was that just at functions? I remember, I remember. I think that was actually, uh, aye, functions and, and, and getting the odd night out. Uh, they, they met, I don't know if, I think Stuart's still in Australia, yeah. but I don't know if Ian, uh, Eric Ferguson, still with the, the girl he met, but he married her, aye. That's uh, incredible, isn't it? Must be easy please in Australia. Fergie's getting married. <laughs> 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 Where are, did, did he have a career after? I remember him in the team. Went to, I think he went to them for him. Oh, that's uh, right. We're no short either, but this big, massive snout, right? And Speaks for yourself. I, I know. But Stan Anderson used to give him dogs abuse about his size. He's, and especially at Team 40, he's not like Stan would shoot at him and all that, but he's a big bugle. Uh, he was standing next to folk. But uh, it, was, uh, it, was, uh, it was an eye opener that trip. Uh, uh, well, my, my, my memories of that. A young boy and the team 40 at the time, the pinstripes, yeah. home right. strap in the white with the red and the blue pinstripe for the waist strap. Yeah. So, the sort of first team regulars would be in the blue, right. and the boys and the reses res would white. be in the white. Yeah, right. And it, I used to go through the 40, you could name all the ones in blue, name all other, and then I try to get to remember all the ones in uh, the, the waist strap. So, you know, the Eric Ferguson's and stuff like that. And Andy, Andy Willock, remember, we winger. Yeah. Billy Muir, uh, ones that kind of just come to me. Tom Lehman, you remember the story about Tom Lehman? No. Signed a boy for the island and uh, he was in the reserves uh, and he, oh, he was just, he was mad as a brush, this boy. And he, he made his debut for the reserves and he put his tap on uh, back to front running down. <laughs> 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 He's excited, I. <laughs> 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 They're like, Tom, what? We have got your top on the right way. Hover, Roxy. Change the one half way. Tom Lehman. There was a lot of boys brought over for Northern Ireland. There was outside. young Philip Nell, yeah. uh, Tom Lehman. Uh, they were good. It didn't work out for the boys. went back out of the road. I think Philip went on then. We just didn't get in the Irish leagues. I don't know what Tom is doing now. But, uh, As a pal of mine, Brian Kennedy, he done the same at the same time. He ended up honestly. on field, Clint Horn and stuff like that. Like, I, I feel it, you know, coming through the troubles over there, and the Rangers went to saying you get in the ferry or you're going to play for Rangers or be part of the club. I feel like that must have been for the boys, Craig. You know what I mean? I know what it's like for us being here, we were all, all Rangers boys, but to come for the island, and pals knowing they were way with Rangers and, and in full time, it must have been. Legends in the street oh, aye. without even playing. <laughs> exactly, totally. Uh, it was interesting. So, come back for that uh, trip in the first team regular by that point. Yeah, uh, that that's when uh, I think the gaffer had made his mind up about me being there long term. Um, and and obviously, I then I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know what was happening. I remember that we were just back to the trip, and then I get the phone call doing into the boot room. Joe Mason says the gaffer's want to see you. So you get up that stairs, knowing you had did well on the world tour, but you de really didn't know what you was getting to when you're going up into his office. So, as the people would know, Big Joe was a big intimidating guy. He treated everybody for the last season of the last to Coop, who was the top player, the exact same. Everybody got kept in the same level. And he was sitting, uh, shut the door, and I went. And I didn't know what was happening. I knew it would, I did well enough for him. That I would get kept. Sorry, are you you're past your first year apprentice at this time? Aye, I'm just coming out. Aye, I'm just coming out my apprentice, but no sign my long term contract, right? Aye, because the, the long term stuff came after the, the, the tour because I'm still only just 17 about yeah, 18. Yeah. And um, she sat down, he says, uh, There's very good reports in the reserves for Wally Waddle and Mr. Fail about you. He says, uh, I've seen it for myself in Australia, you could be a part of this club for a long time. He says, I like the way you go about your business. He says, I'm going to give you a long-term contract. Hi, guys. I'd just like to take a, a minute to talk to you about NordVPN, which is a company that I use their services. I use it majority of the time when I'm traveling abroad, when I want to uh, keep up to date with the programs I'm watching at the time, or more importantly to me, 
Um, the sports that I want to watch when I'm abroad, so it doesn't matter where I am in the world, I can still watch the channels and the games and the sports that I want to. It also gives me security and some privacy that I'm looking for when I'm browsing the internet. They've got an exclusive huge discount available to viewers of the podcast, and they'll give you an additional four months free and top of whichever package you go on if you use our, our code. To get that, plus a 30-day, no quibble, uh, money-back guarantee, all you need to do is log on to nordvpn.com backslash Craig, C-R-A-I-G, and that will get you the exclusive discount plus the four months free on top of whichever package you go for. So go and give them a look, guys, and certainly I've had no problem using them in the times I'm travelling abroad when I mostly use them. Thank you very much. Uh, and by this time, Mars is making buttons. I'm sitting there and I'm going, what's coming here? No days, no agent, no nothing. I could go straight in. He says, uh, I'm going to give you a three-year contract. He says, your wages will go for what you're on the new. If you play in the first team, you'll get £300 a week. You've got £100 appearance money and you'll get £100 win bonus. Because we're still only one about 100 quid because we're only just still kids. And he went, how does that sound, Huey? Uh, Shuggy used to say, Shuggy. I says, Gaffer, that sounds amazing. I says, that's brilliant. I says, um, if I'm not in the first team, what's going, to, what's going to be my wage? He says, you'll get double what you're getting in now. He says, but your incentive is to get in the first team and play. He says, and you're no far away from being a regular after what I saw. The God's strength me doing dead, and I tell a lot of people this, if I go out and do dinners, what I mean, it's true. And not a lot of people will know if you hadn't been to the dinner. So he says to me, he says, I'm no long back up the road anyway. It gives you a second stint for the light being at Leicester. He says, um, where is it your fee, Shuggy? I says, uh, I'm for I'm for Lark Cole Gaffer. And he looked at me. And he says, uh, see that three years contract, son? That's not fine. Stop. Laura, get in here and change this contract. No. <laughs> I swear, I swear. The God strike me doing dead, honestly. Laura, get in here and change this contract. And uh, Laura, come in. He says, change that to five years with you. Five year deal. It's uh, because I told him it's for Lark Hall. Party at Lark Hall that night, was it? <laughs> Couldn't believe that. Couldn't believe it. Three years was good enough. Five year was stratosphere, wasn't it? Unbelievable. So uh, that was me again here, Matt Knight. And, Give my mum and dad good news. I was only one because I, I, they were a big part of my life and my papa, who lived with me at the time, he was a wee ex-footballer and he uh, played in the junior level and they were like, we were, we were, we were all together, the four at that time, me, my mum, my dad and my papa because yeah. neighbours are still straight and uh, in the house and everything was always discussed with us four. So it was like, oh, the hard graft, the day in the school runs yeah, and yeah. day in the stuff and it was nice just to sit that night and know that I'd signed a five-year contract for Rangers. I get it from my mum and dad. Oh, I, I mean, proud parents. Everybody's oh, uh, proud of their range. My dad kept his cell uh, out the road. My dad was the one who pushed his parents. My papa, he slaughtered me because, you know, he 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 would come to games and sit in the back of the motor and give me dogs abuse the way him. But my dad would say nothing. I knew, I knew if I did a bad, I knew if I did a bad game, my dad would say he had a quiet game. <laughs> aye, <laughs> basically, aye. Oh, shit. Aye. But the wee and wee Huey, I was named after my grandfather in the back. You get told that. Slaughtered. Early dinner, and oh, my mother says she used to be listening to that radio Clyde. Burns has got a book in on when we're getting beat, and we're like, oh, dinner's going to be a nightmare than that again. <laughs> so it was the happiest dinner in the world when Rangers won. It was the worst dinner in the world if we had lost. But that's the way it was. So, some good times. I mean, I remember I started watching Rangers as a kid and going to games. I was born when we'd won trebles, but I have no memory of it. I was too young. So I started going to the games. 80, 81, that was sort of my time. Yeah. And I remember the Skull Cup final. Yeah. We won a, two, a trophy. No. It was massive to me. Yeah. And, you know, I think I've been full circle with Rangers. You know, we went for that to, you know, the revolution that happened and we were nine in a row and then obviously admin and yeah, yeah. it's been like that. Um, but to have lived through that time, getting to a Skull Cup final was a massive, no, and winning it yeah. was just incredible. And I, 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 I said to Davey as well, I've got a soft touch for that pre-86 teams because that was my Rangers. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And my, my, my dad would be, and my granny would be telling me all these wonderful stories about Willie Johnson and Colin Steen and 
you know, even before that, uh, the older players of my granny would go on to me about. But my, that was my Rangers team. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think sometimes the, the quality of the players that were in that team and the squad at the time don't get the appreciation that they deserve. Mm -hmm. um, it was tough times for the club, but we still had some good players. Yeah, there was tough times for the club, and I was talking about the players that, that, that had came through and then survived the takeover uh, with David Holmes coming in and soon as he then coming in as manager. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, all those players, soon as he used them all. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of players that he used. So I remember the 84 Cup final. Big job was a lover of taking uh, the team to Turnby. Mm -hmm. And again, he, he enlarges the score a bit because it was a Sunday kickoff, which we had never heard of either. And it was sponsored by Skull. And it was televised. So it was a big thing. I played in the semi final against Dundee United. But no knowing in that game, Ian Redford, who sadly no with us, Reddy had got booked and had been was then suspended for the final. Pritzy had got injured, was then suspended for the final. So I'd been doing well in the reserves and on just the, you know the edges of been getting in the team when he picked this big squad to go to Turnbury. And chuffed to be in the squad. Uh, the paper reports were uh, the team was going to pick itself. Uh, again, no longer with his big Colin McAdam, big Colin was always going to be one of his subs. It was really between myself, Flecky, or, or we, Derek, Ferguson, three young boys really, didn't have a lot of options, that's how thin the squad was. So from that point of view, I got a bit of luck when the squad was stead bearing a wee bit to get in. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember him, he named the team at Tunbury, we trained down at Troon, we went back down to Troon to train, came back up and I trained like a dog as if, you know, I'm, I'm letting him know I'm here. And I remember him saying to me in the quiet arm, he says, you're on the bench because you press me in training for you. Um, but he didn't name the subs to we go there and get in the, the dressing room at Hamden and all the, the strips were all hung up uh, and there was a 12 and a 14. And I forget him, I remember as if it's uh, yesterday, it says 12's McAdam and 14's Burn. And uh, I just went, no way. Cup final. <laughs> <laughs> Ass collapsed, right? <laughs> and I went, right, okay. So, again, not really been in that environment or that situation. And I, I, I don't know, I don't know when, what made me do it, but within about 10 minutes, I had my gear on, right? Ready to go. And Coyce is like, what are you doing, you silly bastard? He said, we've got enough tours before the game starts. <laughs> <laughs> I said, there's need to take this top off me, by the way, right? So I'm sitting there ready to go, and they're all walking about with their suits, darling. I'm sitting there with the, the bits and the shin gears. I'm ready to go. So I'm in tears, I know it today. They're all laughing at me. But anyway, uh, but you know, wanted to park, warming up, and then seeing people that feel that call, oh, shuggy, like I knew they knew me. And shuggy, how are you doing, all right? Keep your head down, blah, blah, blah. But the game was, was was incredible. We're two up. They come back, as they do. Last minute free kick. And then uh, McCoy's gets a winner. Up the steps. <laughs> Mental. That, that, that game probably played a big part in McCoy's career going forward because that was, I think that was him. Oh, yes. That was his mark. That was his game. Yes. Folk just went, oh, here, we've got something here. I definitely uh, played up front. In fact, that particular game, uh, we started with Sandy Clark. John McDonald up front. Coisty played the middle of the part with mm -hmm. Big Slum. So he brought Solo off, put me in the middle, put Coisty up um, to become then the striker with Sandy. So I uh, Coisty was, he was, he was a good player and he was tough, Coisty, and took absolute dogs abuse for a long time, Craig, as we know. Again, the younger fans will know that, the older ones will. Mm -hmm. You know, remember the Dundee game, the, the Scott, you know, the game at Ibrox when they were Ali, Ali, get to F, you know. Oh, and, I was there. Yeah, I was sitting there standing, I'm like, oh my God. And Bomber was playing with Dundee, we spoke about that, you know, and um, he says, oh, it was terrible. Full stadium, Matt, eh, Craig. Dogs abuse. Who'd have thought McCoy's would ever get dogs abuse? And then he come through the way he done. What a character you, you need about yourself to do that. And, and, and I don't think his, his time down at Sunderland would let Brent Fish and Johnson down there. And there was rumours at the time he was going to sign for Rangers instead of Sunderland. It never happened. Went down there for a couple of years. And I think I, I worked in Sunderland for a while. Uh, and um, about 15, 20 years ago. And I often would ask Sunderland supporters, the older ones, what they thought, and they were, they've got more memories. It didn't quite work for him, but he wasn't despised there. No, I think... They, they, they could see that it was a boy there with talent. And he was very tried, young, away from home. Aye. Um, um, but when he came to us, it was no better roses to start with. No, it wasn't. And he spent, I think, 
some decent money on him as well. It's great. Mm -hmm. I think we saved four hundred thousand pounds, which is a lot of money back mm -hmm. in the day. And uh, again, he struggled to find his feet. Hit the back of the net. That's what he was brought for. Um, and it didn't. It didn't work initially for him. But he wasn't long after that particular game. I think you're right. I think that was the, the cornerstone of him kicking on in his Rangers career. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to against Celtic in the League Cup final. 60,000, 70,000 there. Um, you know, I, I, I actually don't remember things that happened in the game, but I remember, I remember uh, going up, I remember lifting the cup up, I remember lifting the cup, and I remember going back to, I remember going back to a um, party at Ibrox, and it was one lo lose or draw back anyway, right. so it'd have been subdued if you'd, you'd get beat, but you can imagine what it was, what it was like. So the, um, You'd played schoolboy up to just under 18s and whatever with Scotland. Had you played at Hamden before? I hadn't played at Hamden. No, oh. no, that was my first time. Even uh, it would, wait, if, we, if we took the reserves over, it was less at Hamden we played in. So I had never been at Hamden. Been at Hamden to watch Scotland games and watch Rangers games. But no, never been on the park. And it just seemed, Craig, it seemed like, oh my God, look at the size of this place. I think as you, when you're younger, you do, you think, you know, oh, couldn't believe the size of it. No, it's no wonder you can't remember much about the game, but the, no, well, the, it, the it, stuff they build up and all that. 40 years ago. 40 years ago, the game. You know what I mean? Uh, build up. I remember the build up and going, um, getting in the bus and fans here, obviously, for both sides, getting pelters for, for the dark side. And uh, again, I was kind of incognito because they didn't know me. But uh, the usual suspects got it, uh, but just laugh. Uh, but again, um, Again, a, a, a new thing for me was, you know, driving uh, from Turnbury and hang, hitting maybe the outskirts of Glasgow and Big Joke does his favourite thing, taps a wee bus driver in the back. Tunes. Get the tunes on. <laughs> uh, and, and then there's a funny one, isn't there? There's a funny one, there's a funny story about uh, a wee pits he was in the bus and he comes up and Big Joke's like, sing, sing. <laughs> uh, and and Pitsy, uh, I, I don't know the words, gaffer. He says, well, fucking hum it then, son. Hum it. <laughs> <laughs> hum it in Swedish. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, Imagine so, that today. <laughs> hum it right in his face. Oh, brilliant. So Big Joe loved the tunes. Loved the tunes. Because, of course, Big Joe loved the tunes because they wouldn't have known what's going on outside. You know, and especially, you know, you know London Road and you're going out to Selly Park. You know, the game's further down the line. And you're sitting like, ah, sure it is all. They're not singing, but they'll fix the look for you. And they're out there giving you dogs if you should be belting out the bully boys on the team bus. <laughs> Tremendous. And then obviously, and then again, back then, it was Jim, Jimmy Bell drove the bus then as well. And there was a guy just before Jimmy, I forget his name, he knew exactly when he turned it off. <laughs> so they <laughs> we just pick up what we're listening to on the bus. When, when we went to Celtic, but that was that was big joke for you, and that was you're right. That was the days for you. That's, that's my arm. So, you, what year did you make your debut? Uh, I think eighty four. I think that just right. prior to that uh, school cup final. That's when I started getting into the first team. Just at the, just at the kind of into the new year of the eighty four season. So many games would you played against Celtic? You ever looked at that? Uh, I haven't really looked at it, but I wouldn't be far away. For maybe double figures anywhere, but I think oh, it's got to be 10 12. Uh, weekend, uh, I, think, like. I, might, I think I'm running about that, but at that time they were predominantly well, Aberdeen, of course, were the, the team that just won the, the, the Cup Winners Cup. Celtic were had always just the better hand of us. We played in some great games and some great tussles for each games and stuff like that. Yeah, for each game, that was in my I think that's the single maddest game of football. Well, I've ever as soon played. as his first game, that was as soon as his first game, he'd come up. To watch it, they'd signed them, they'd made the, the announcement, and and, um, and and he and he came in, and, and there was a there was a few played that night. Actually, it was quite decent because David McKinnon played in it. Uh, we Bobby had played and we Bobby Russell. There was boys that he'd freed, but he still played them to kind of put them in the shop windows. It was actually quite it was quite decent, but obviously again, surprise, surprise, uh, boys to get some goals and different things. You know what I mean? So, uh, so your time. Maybe playing out. This is the thing I see a lot of players. It doesn't matter if you played 10 times for Rangers or 110 times for Rangers or 1,000 times for Rangers. You played for Rangers. And for the tens of thousands that go to Ibrox every 
every game and the hundreds of thousands that support for far and possibly the millions, they would give body parts to have played one game or part of one game for Rangers. Um, so it doesn't matter to me that you played 10 old firms or 100 old firms. You played in an old firm game, Shug. That is an amazing... To have done one game for Rangers, amazing. To have done one old firm game, tops that. Yeah. But to do 9, 10, 11, 12 of them, do you get it? I mean, is, is it... Is it something that you're aware of about how people would have loved to have done that? They just did, never had that opportunity. I think um, I was always quite a people person anyway. You know, I would be at dinners, I would be at young player of the years, player of the years, blah, blah, blah. So I was always probably a wee bit more connected to, to punters than probably anybody in the dressing room, I'll be honest. There was a lot of them didn't like going to dinners. Um, I thought, uh, these guys pay your wages, I, I'm, I'm going to go. And Big Joe was a lover of I was going to dinners at that time. Uh, and predominantly I was maybe a young player, Goyce was player. So we were doing a lot of double double dunts, going to two and then one night. And so you were you were always feeling what punters were telling you. And, and what you were, and I would always listen because I was a punter, I was a, a supporter eventually after the Murrow thing. I loved it. Being part of Rangers Football Club um and being in the team. So um I I I, I never uh, I'd never underestimate how a fan felt towards the club. I would always endorse that. I'd always bring that into me uh, because um, that's that was in my upbringing, really. Just to... so these number of um, Celtic games that you, you, you must have been fantastic playing in them. What's your your funniest moment in that? Uh, stuff that must go on in the park that fans just can't see because of the noise and, and it's attracted. There must be absolute capers going on in these parts during these games. Can you, which are, um, I remember, I remember one particular time. Parkhead, the tunnel, as you know, it is. It's not as tight as it used to be. It used to be, it was one at a time could just get through that wee uh, step up, get into the dressing rooms, uh, and and if there was ever anybody that, that I wanted to kick at, at that time, it was Morris Johnston, right? <laughs> Yeah, but he really was right when, when you know, uh, the old acrobat on and all that during the game, and he would show, he would, he would bring it out. Wait, but that was his game. He would wind you up, and I'm mate, the easiest guy in the world to wind up. You know, I mean, a steam coming out of my ears, and uh, he, he's shouting at you. And he was flying at that time for sale. He was scoring a lot of goals, and um, I'm, I just made sure I said, "Well, see if I'm not getting near you on the part, I'm going to get near you. Get up the tunnel at half time, and." Uh, I done everything but tackle him, get up the tunnel, right? I, I, I kind of, I, I made it out that I, I stumbled on him, but I, I grabbed his hair at the same time, and I kind of pulled his hair as he was getting up the stairs, and he was coming back down the stairs at the same time. And I remember him this clump of hair, and the next thing he's turned around, he said, "A swing at me," and all the players are all in about it. And <laughs> uh, you know, the day there was no security, and you know, I never just saw. So you know, all the players that sorted it out, they're into hairdressing, they're into mine, big jokes. What's going on out there? I says, oh, I says, I'm about that, Morris Johnson. Never mind out there, get fucking in it, I'm out there, you know, one of the ones. Uh, I says, right, okay, I'll see what I can do. So, uh, stuff like that. Um, there was always a bit of respect, again. Uh, they had probably more Glasgow boys, Celtic supporters playing for them and likewise with us. So it was like supporters playing against one another. Mm. But there was never, um, there was never any bigotry, there was never any, uh, you know, you know, Slagging, you know, and for, for that point of view. Um, so there was nothing really. I would tell you, I would be honest and tell you, you know, there's no oh, Coop was funny, you know, Coop, Coop, would, Coop would wind them up, Coop would love to wind them up. He was funny. I, I, I went out of the jungle, the far side at, at Parkhead, and we'd be waiting. Uh, the, the, the referee coming out, Coop would be on the touchline, and at that time, the jungle, I mean, they put the fences up after I think the what was it, the thingley game there, they, they get the bottle onto the pitch. And Coop, would, aye, and Coop would be uh, cute as you like. He would do Cooper, Cooper. Coop would be like, oh, well, listen to me, listen to me. Man. <laughs> I'm like, I know, I know, it's brilliant, isn't it? And, uh, and he's like, oh, fucking bastard. <laughs> and then he would just go casually, right? And uh, he, would, he would casually, not even turn around, but we go to scratch his back, right? But he would just put the two fingers up to him, right? Just the two, and even the linesman was laughing, right? <laughs> And they were all going mental trying to get through the fence. They were like, I'm double out before the game starts. <laughs> it was brilliant. Hans in the hat. No, I used to stop me, Hans in the hat. Two fingers and get up. You see, 
<laughs> oh, it oh, was, oh, was so funny, Craig. Just wee daft things, wee daft yeah. things. But I travelled with Coop, so Coop was great for me. Um, as much as uh, Coop was known as the Moody Blue, yeah. and didn't say much. Coop, see, Coop was brilliant at singing. He was a great singer. And I used to drive my wee dad's blue escort and pick him up. Coop never drove to him into Yeah. So I'd get a wee escort and he'd pick me up. Pick me up, Masha. I went, I will pick you up, they bother. Picked him up. He came out in the morning. Coop was immaculate, man. Immaculate. Suits in the morning as well, you know. He used to you know, shaved, smelling a curos. Smelled him, man. I loved him, mate. He was brilliant. And then uh, Gordon Dale with what three doors down, he, he came out like a vagrant, right? Yeah. <laughs> When I see the state of him, he can eat it, you know, and have a colon tie, toast, coffee. He wasn't playing, he'd fell out with the world. Surprise, surprise, still is. But how you want to be with somebody and no like the other one, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But even just a young boy driving in, uh, going in was um was 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 great for me learning. Mm -hmm. Uh but we used to sing the songs. Cook used to sing daft songs and and who'd be playing heart? Oh, playing against hearts. I hate playing against that bastard water kid, because what he just kicked him all the time. But he could never get the better of what he. But going in, pick him up, take him home, take me to Willie's, take you to Willie's, Willie Hills, uh, up, up in Hamilton. But Coop was just, uh, was, uh, he wouldn't give you a fright, you know what I mean? He's tight as two coats of pain. <laughs> he would count the money days, he, he'd go, you know that, right? You pick me up Monday, but he didn't drop me off. Pick me up Tuesday, drop me, and he would work out his petrol money to give me. <laughs> it was murder. Brilliant. Murder. But I just, it was, a, it was great honour just to have him in the car. So the, Rangers change. Um, a lot of people, this is something that it's crazy how history sometimes gets a wee bit blighted by people. A lot of people think David Murray started the Rangers revolution, but David Murray came in after. after. Soon as mm -hmm. Mr. Holmes came. And, um, oh, is it Mr. Holmes, is it? Well, I've got a lot of respect for him. Okay. Um, you know. Well, we'll take that <laughs> if you want. And uh, the whole thing changed. So, did you go out and loan when soon as came? Is that how it worked? Did you have a bit of time left in your contract? How did what happened when he arrived and the, the, the club changed? Uh, I do remember um, the club changing and going back to the that Glasgow Cup final. That was his first game. He, he came in, uh, but when soon as had uh, six or seven months left, his playing contract at some mm. they got Walter immediately from Dundee United. So for six months prior to soon as coming. Walter was a gaffer. Yeah. And uh, there was never a nicer place to play because we actually raised the bar for Walter and results started getting better. I had played for Walter in the uh, 21s. Oh, yeah. Right. And uh, I remember him saying to me, I had just missed it in Mexico because golf was right back. And uh, they reckoned that my fitness wasn't good enough to go and play in Mexico because I was doing well with the 21s and I'm in the Rangers team. So obviously, if you can get in the Scotland team, he says, but you'll be part of things here. And uh, when Graham arrives, that's for sure. So that was walking back from uh, Bell Houston doing a stint over there one day. And I remember it, it, it just went, it been all right, so I went, all right, that's all right. He says, Graham's due to arrive. He knows all about you. 21's is good. Press me when I was in charge of 21's, blah, blah, blah. I'm in the Rangers first team. I'm playing under Walter Smith. And I'm, I'm the first choice right back at Rangers. So... I thought when Big Jock went, um, it was sad because he'd put me in. He'd given me what I had. He had learned me a lot of things. And I thought when Soonest came in, I thought, I, I've got to learn under a guy like him Soonest. Especially when I liked him as a player. I always thought he looked to part. He had a bit of quality about him. He was naughty. He looked, you know, he looked to part. And, and I thought, great, I, I've got to. I've got to learn under this guy when he arrives. Mm -hmm. So for a few months before he arrived, I was on the team, um, playing well, and uh, looking forward to him, to him coming to the club. He, he came in, he did the press stuff, blah, 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 met everybody. The first time he saw me was that uh, Glasgow Cup final. I had a really good game. Craig. You know, sometimes you come off and you don't know, I knew I did a good game. And I went home, I was delighted. And... Uh, Really, that was a breakup for the, for the pre-season then. So we then came in uh, about four or five weeks later and went on a pre-season trip to Switzerland. But this time, soon as I nearly sat down with anybody and spoke to them because he had just come in in a blaze of glory. Uh, and um, I remember going to Switzerland. And we went on a 
I kind of a, a night out with the guy took us to his house and out in the, the hills where the games hadn't started. And we were playing these silly games. Uh, you had to go up, make basically an arse yourself in front of the players. And I was talking to Cooper at the time, and uh, he was like, I was looking around about to get somebody up, and um, he says, "Right, Shog, it's your turn." I says, "Gaffer," I says, "I can't do that." I says, "I'm always things like that." He says, "Come on, get yourself up there." When probably in hindsight, I should have just went up, made an arse of myself. I don't know what we're asking me today. I went, "No, Gaffer, I'm talking to Cooper here." Oh, that was that. Oh, he got off his chair at the bar. And everybody went, oh, what is going on here? Run right around the bar to me. He went, you fucking too good to do that. I says, Gaffer, I didn't know why I did that. He says, I'm going to tell you something right now. He says, my card's been marked about you. Craig, honestly, God. I went, what the fuck is he talking about? My card's been marked about you. Kurt looked at me, I looked at him. Because as soon as he said this aura about him, that people were, were, were a wee bit oof, standoffish and a wee bit mm-hmm. uh, a wee bit timid of it. For me, and little did I know, that was that was the end of my career at Ibrox. And I'll tell you why. I had went to a range of supporters dance at the end of that season before we, we get back to do pre-season. And David Holmes was there. And uh, the MC of the night asked me, and I'm only young, I've never done a lot of public speaking, but I'm comfortable chatting, you know I'm. And uh, he asked me about uh, the arrival of Graham Souness and what it would mean for my career. I says, well, Jock Wallace would be like a father figure to me. I'm, I'm gutted that the club uh, parted ways. I says, but I'll tell you something, if I can't learn under somebody like Graham Souness and play under somebody that I've watched for a number of years, then there'll be something wrong. I says, and uh, well, obviously, Manzi will come in and put his own ideas and his own stamp in the club. I says, and hey, strangely enough, we might be allowed moustaches, you know, as well. <laughs> right, because at that time, no, yeah. no facial hair. That's right. Um, the, the, after the, 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 inter, the altercation in Switzerland, it then came to light that David Holmes had went back and told Sunnis what I'd said that our supporters do. What had you said that would upset anybody? Nothing, apart from players with allowed moustaches. That's incredible. And in the referee's room, when I went to see soon as when we get back, he went, aye, fucking bad mouth me. His supporters do and all that. She said, girlfriend, I didn't bad mouth you. And I knew right away it was David, David Holmes that had told him what I'd said. And it was a, it was just a throwaway laugh because it, it got a cheap laugh. It was like, because it was the first thing when we Bobby came for you. Big jokes like them with that beard off, no moustaches, no facial, no not. And David Holmes went back and told soon as uh, what I'd said. And it was just, Craig, it was it was just nothing, but it, it was everything because he had made his mind up. And Craig, honestly, I, I was I was well good enough to play in that team. I was merely good enough. And if I if I had to get a chance, I'd just never get a chance. So other than the, which was his first game, but wasn't he really the, the, his first full season? Did you play any of that when you came back to Switzerland? Did you ever play for Rangers again? Aye, he brought me in. Uh, he, he treated me like a, treated me like a, like a dog. I was back in the way dressing him. Peter McLeod was in charge of the reserves. Peter had turned a wee bit against me. Walter had to because as soon as was, you know, I was his gaffer. Uh, and I knew Walter had felt sorry for me. I knew that. But football, look after, football people look after their cell, Craig. Right? And I knew that. And I would nothing ever against Walter because he had to go where the gaffer had said, even though I knew Walter liked me. Uh, I remember one particular Friday, sheep went up, knew I wouldn't be on it. And I was going to do an the boot room. We trained. And he went, soon as went, and this is probably the first time he even spoke to me for that. He went, shall you play in the morning? Right, okay, so I want you to play wide here for don't concentrate your defending. I want you to bomb forward. So I mean I'll play behind you. I was like, oh, I'm in. It's up to me. A really good game. Fans are delighted I'm back the team. For obscurity, really. Uh, good game. Beat hearts. Uh, play against Hank St. Mern in the midweek, beat them, still on the team. Wide right. Just Jimmy and I working as a wee tandem, bombing on. And then went to Hibs on the Saturday. It wasn't as good. Uh, 
we were losing one nil. He hooked me because I knew it was coming, and uh, I never played for Rangers again uh, after that. So, what caused the, the the gap in the team for him to have to put you in? I mean, obviously, it's fair to say that he wouldn't have wanted to do no. it. Would have been his first choice. No, so I, th what, what? I think I think somebody had one of his midfield players had been injured. I just can't remember who it was. The back four kind of was picking itself. It was Jimmy Nick, uh, Big Terry, Slum, and Stuart Stuart Monroe. Monroe. And the middle of the park would have been probably Gerrani, uh, Coisty up front, Coot wide left, Big Ted, um, Cami maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I'm going through that team again, and there was a lot of them, Fergie, Gerrani, yeah. like all, all, all boys that I was brought up with there. Yeah. So. so it was hard and sore to accept that I was the, the one that wasn't getting the chance through uh, what had been said or what hadn't been said and what have you, and and I don't I don't know whether me being a big blue nose um, and having that uh, persona, having it, whether soon as liked that or not, uh, because you never really heard that side of him as a manager. He was not really want to get involved in all that uh, the Ranger Celtic thing. He was a wee bit more uh, away from that. So uh, who knows? Um, I'm sitting here at fifty eight, going on fifty eight, and. I, I still feel as if I got a raw deal. I know people, I know people look at, at any jobs again. We're all day different jobs, and it's how you got on me, a manager. It's how you got on me, the people that own the club. Um, but it seems to have been that it seemed to have kind of followed me through my career, um, because the the move after that, um, you probably want to go into, was was one of the, the one of the worst experiences that I ever ever had um as as a professional footballer. Um I went to Hearts. Uh, I went to Leeds United on loan and I got a phone call at my uncles in Leeds from Alan McDonald to say that they wanted me to come and play for Hearts. And uh I says I can't come and play I can't come back and play against the Rangers. Why? He says Sandy and I done it. I says, I know you've done it very successful. I says, but I, I'm, I'm going to come to England. I want to come to Leeds. Ben was the manager there. I, I was at a couple of games in reserves. He liked what he saw. So it was either Leeds or Bradford just after the fire. Trevor Cherry was the manager. They wanted it to take me there. Stuart McCall was there. John Henry and Valley Parade was rebuilt. So it was one or the other. And McMurdo phoned me. Shoggy. He says, this deal's on. He says, they're going to give you an excursion of payment. You'll get well weighed in. I'd see you left my contract, hearts will pay you, your wages will go up, it's a no-brainer, and it'll get you playing again. Hearts, at that time, were predominantly taking players for Rangers who weren't getting into the team. They took a lot of players over mm -hmm. the years, ex-Rangers players. So I went home, spoke to my mum and dad, and I knew Hearts had a good support. It was a great atmosphere playing there. Um, it, it could have been worse moves for me when I looked at it, and I went... Right, okay, Fort Big Slim. Big Slim is gutted. Big Slim is gutted because he played in the championship winning team and was only made available when Hearts made inquiries about him. And Slim was like flabbergasted. They had just won the league for Rangers and as soon as we prepared to sell him. Because Big Slim had played, I think, left back. He played a lot at left back for Sunus. So he was more, he it was more, the, the deal was more surprising him. So it was a double deal. Then it was a double deal. So I went to Hearts, um, Big Slim and I were driving through M8 to the press conference. We must have looked at the two most depressed players I was in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Oh, well, it is always raining on me. I've so always wanted to play for Hearts. We're all in that hill. So I got to share it, and it was quite funny because that was on STV News at night. Slim and I sitting there with the meter copiers top on yeah. Hearts. And we're sitting there like four, four, four prisoners, never like new signings. So anyway, I'll, I'll quickly cut to the chase. The reason I'm saying the move didn't work out. Three years ago, three years ago, and this all adds up to why this happened at Hearts. Three years ago, my wee pal Bobby Russell was in the tune. It was before the pandemic. I'm having a beer and he went, hi, hey, you, you, wee Bobby's getting a drink in him and he's funny, wee Bobby at the time. I love him at that. And he went, you cost me a move to hearts, you. He says to me. I said, what are you talking about, dafty? 
never cost you a move. He says, you cost me a move. He says, how do you work that out? He said, I don't know if he's telling this or not. I says, well, when you say that, you've got to know, ain't you? I says, uh-huh. what happened? He says, Alec and Doddy inquired about Slim. And the only reason they were going to get Slim was to take me. So the phone call for Doddy down to Leeds to bring me back up the road was a lie. To take me to Tyne Castle and play me was a lie and tell me that I was only one part of the deal and they couldn't believe it when soon as then offered Slim was another lie. Sandy Jardin is no longer with us and I'll say what I need to say and Alan McDonald still does his work at Ibrox. The two of these guys as ex-Rangers players actually treated me worse than what soon as done. Uh, I've never felt so far out of things in all my life at being a football club and the way the two guys treated me. I couldn't get into the first team at, I, at Hearts for Walter Kid. My dad could have got in before for going Walter Kid. Right? And the fans were going, what is happening here? Why is this boy not playing? He didn't want me anywhere near the ground. It was slim they wanted. And it wouldn't have mattered what I'd done. They put me back out. When I went in, I played. Put me back out. Put me in. Put me out. Treated me like shit in their shoe. 